Hi and welcome to another episode of Mr. Ford's Guide to the a Certification Exam, How to Be a Computer Technician. In this episode, we look at some common electrical hazards and how to protect your computer from them. Hey, welcome back. In this video, I want to talk about a couple of common electrical events. Those include brownouts, blackouts, power spikes, lightning storms, and EMI. And these are all good things to know about both for a technician as well as a consumer and, of course, the exam. So let's begin by talking about brownouts. Now, if you've ever lived in an apartment or dorm or anything like that, you know that when somebody flushes the toilet while you're taking a shower, the water pressure changes. It either gets crazy cold or crazy hot. And that's what a brownout is. It's not a turning off of the water. It's a changing, it's a dropping of the water pressure. The water goes down. It doesn't come out with the same force. In this case, the brownout would be electrical. So electricity doesn't go out, but there's less of it coming through the outlets. And this is a good example of when it's like crazy hot in the summer, there might be a heat wave and you might have brownouts where the power kind of goes down as the grid is really getting tested. It's getting stress tested. So when the power goes back to normal, and this is where the damage really happens, is when the power goes back to normal, it just doesn't come up and get back to normal. There's always a huge gush. It's always kind of a tidal wave of power that comes back. And this spike is what can really damage your computer. Over time, it can really cause some damage to your computer. So brownouts, um, yeah, the brownout, the lack of electricity can hurt your computer, but it's that power spike, it's that power flush of, inf of, of, of juice that comes back that can do the damage. Blackouts are is when the power goes completely out. There's no power. Boom, bam, you hear some transformer blow. Power goes out. Nothing's on. That's bad. Again, the damage from this one is really when the power comes back on. The power goes out. It's not a good way to shut down a computer. But when the power comes back on, again, it's this huge tidal wave of electricity, of current that comes to your house, which can cause damage. And of course, if you lose power to your computer, if you haven't saved recently, it's all gone. So brownouts, less power. Blackouts, no power. Then we have something called line noise. Line noise is when you have small variations in voltage of the power line. So for example, if you have a computer system on the same uh, circuit as, let's say, a water cooler or a refrigerator or something like that, when they kick on, it can cause kind of spiky, dirty electricity to come into your computer. And so it's small variations in voltages, and over time it can really hurt your computer. Back in another life, almost, I used to do disc jockey work. And I had my, my mobile DJ set, and I'd go place to place. And I would always plug my equipment into a, a, a cleaner that I had that would get plugged into the wall because you never know what kind of electricity is coming out of the wall at different venues, different places that you would go play. And so you'd want to make sure that your, your line was clean. And so this would condition the electricity that was coming out. Then we have the power spikes. This is the bad stuff. These are really, really not any fun. If the spike is big enough, your computer will have major issues. And power spikes is what kills your computer at the end of the day. A big power spike can really whack your computer down. And then we have lightning storms. Lightning storms are pretty bad. And the only way, and this is an important note, the only way to protect your computer and peripherals connected to that computer is to unplug it. To unplug it from the wall, to not just shut it down, but to unplug it. It's the only way to make sure it doesn't get fried. Also, never have your computer plugged into the wall without a surge suppressor during an electrical storm. And remember to plug in a modem. If, you have, if you're still using a modem, you want to plug the modem cable into it as well. When lightning strikes nearby, it's called a proximity strike. Again, the best way you can deal with lightning storms is to just simply shut down your computer and unplug it. And that is the best way to make sure that your devices are safe. Also, keep in mind that those newer televisions, those flat screen televisions, are a lot more susceptible to electrical damage than the old televisions, the old CRT televisions. 
they are basically computers. Those flat screen televisions are basically computers, computers with big monitors. And so they are susceptible to being fried just as much as your computer is. So make sure that you have those protected as well. Next, we have EMI. EMI stands for electromagnetic interference. This is electrical noise that all devices emit. So everything that's electrical, everything that has electricity going through it, emits this noise, emits this like this field of electrical noise. And it can interfere with some devices. So for example, if you have a networking cable, you don't want to lay a networking cable over fluorescent lights because the noise can really mess up with the signals. Next, we have types of electrical damage. You can have catastrophic and, again, uh, degradation. Catastrophic is a total wipeout. It's completely and totally destroyed, completely and totally fried. Everything is dead. Degradation is slowly over time. You can't pinpoint the date or the cause of it. It's just stuff is going bad over a period of time. So after all of this talk about all this dangerous stuff, how do you protect the computer? And the two big ways that you need to be aware of are things called UPSs and surge suppressors. The UPS is the preferred method now because it's so much cheaper than it used to be. It used to be very expensive and now it's fairly cheap. UPS stands for Uninterruptible Power Supply. It's basically a battery and surge suppressor fused together. It's a battery surge suppressor hybrid. And what happens with the UPS is it provides enough battery power to shut things down once the power goes out. So if the power goes out, boom, no power. A UPS is supposed to provide enough battery backup in order to allow you to shut things down in a timely fashion. Now, it can depend on how powerful the UPS is to can determine how much battery power you have left. Also, be aware, you never, 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 never plug a laser printer into a UPS. It requires too much electricity. This is both good to know for real world as well as good to know for the A plus exam. There are two basic types of UPSs. You have something called standby power as well as something called online power. Standby power is doing just that, standing by. It's waiting for an event. And hopefully, if the event happens, it will kick in fast enough in order to prevent things from dying on you. So if something happens, it's supposed to kick on so you can have enough power to um, shut things down. Online is always online. And I like to think of online more like the laptop situation. If you have a laptop plugged into the wall and you pull out that plug, it's fine. Nothing happens because your laptop is actually pulling power from your battery. It's not pulling power from the wall. So if the battery's there, it goes to the battery and the battery pulls power from the wall. If you unplug it, Again, it doesn't matter. It was never pulling power from the wall. It was pulling it directly from the battery. And that's what online UPSs are. You're pulling directly from the battery, not from the wall. So if there's a power outage, you definitely don't lose anything because you're going straight to the battery. Now, keep in mind that UPSs require some setup. They may require some software to be installed. They may require you to be plugged into a computer. At the very least, the battery needs to be plugged in. Uh, when I was working for the FBI, the FBI spent a lot of money on some very nice power uh, UPSs for all of us people in this one office. And I mean, spent quite a bit of money, obviously, not, not to mention they were good, but they were also contractors. So we spent twice the amount of money that we normally would on these, these devices. And we paid for them to be delivered. We paid for setup. And we, we noticed that when we lost power, the UPSs would never work. And so it was like, what's going on with these? So one day when the supervisor wasn't there because you're not authorized to do this, you can get written up, by the way, for doing stuff that's outside your job duty. Um, one of the people I was working with decided to open up the bottom of the UPS and discovered <clears throat> that the battery was never plugged in. It was never connected. And so he connected it. And um, we wound up doing it to all the computers while the supervisor was gone. So we had the UPSs that worked. Now we didn't do it to hers because we didn't want to be written up. Um, but that's UPS. Those are battery backups, uninterruptible power supplies. The next one and the older one is the surge suppressor. The surge suppressor is there to help uh, keep the surge from hitting the computer. It's not providing battery backup. It's simply preventing a tsunami of power from hitting your computer. So they absorb power surges. They can come by themselves or part of UPS 
Typically, the more you spend on the surge suppressor, the better the protection. Now, these used to get pretty expensive, but again, UPSs are the preferred technology now, so you can get a really good, good surge suppressor for very little money. Make sure there's a place for your RJ11 phone cord. Again, if you still have a modem, you want to plug your modem cord into the surge suppressor and then into the wall. The main part of the suppressor is called an MOV, which is a metal oxide varistor. This is the thing that takes the hit. It will take the hit from the spike, keeping in mind that surge suppressors typically are there to take that one hit. They're like a good bodyguard. Somebody shoots you, they're taking the hit. They're not taking multiple hits, okay? They're there to take that one hit from you. So a surge suppressor, if you've had a surge suppressor now for six years, it's probably not a surge suppressor anymore. It's probably just a power strip. So you need to replace these, and depending on where you live, every two to three years. Again, depending on where you live. I live in Houston. We get a lot of lightning storms out here. You probably want to place them more frequently. Um, also, if you do get hit, uh, you want to replace it. And a lot of surge suppressors now will have a light to tell you it's working, and you need to double check that sometimes. The two main features of a suppressor are the clamping voltage and the clamping speed. The clamping voltage is the voltage level that it has to get to before it kicks in and blocks the surge. And the clamping speed is just what it sounds like. It's how fast it can kick in to protect the computer and the other devices. Energy absorption is rated in joules. So 200 joules is basic, 400 joules is good, 600 is fabulous. Again, with the price of the surge suppressors, dropping so much i'm sure that the jewels have changed but anything over 600 should be just fine for you okay a lot of interesting stuff there that stuff that you need as a consumer as well as stuff that you need for a technician and a uh, for the a plus exam and the next video we're going to talk about troubleshooting 101 we're going to talk about the mind frame you need to troubleshoot and this is going to be our last video in our chapter one introduction area so until the next video goodbye for now